the brutal truth is that when there's a like a, a nasty evil regime, it's the moderate people of those nasty evil regime that end up being the best people to govern the place afterwards. Yeah. So all the people who governed West Germany and made it really liberal, they were all Nazis. Yep. Right. Almost all. And all the people, they were not from like some anti-Nazi opposition that was like sitting in a concentration camp. Then we let them out and we debothified. No, we didn't. We we said, okay, you were you were a Nazi, but you didn't like, you know, you were just sort of like a bureaucratic Nazi in a back room, like <laughs> who was like, well, I'm not on board with the kill the Jews thing, but I support my country and blah blah blah. Yeah, you're a Nazi, right? You could be you could be killed without the world suffering like a great moral loss, but instead. Uh, pragmatically, you're the only people who know how to run Germany after the war. Welcome to Econ 102, where economist Noah Smith and I make sense of what's happening in the news, technology, business, and beyond through the lens of economics. Let's jump right in. So um, in terms of the episode content this time, you had a couple of pieces on sort of the Asia and Middle East, you know, sort of the Middle East is getting older, Asia is more important to his interest in the Middle East, uh, the Cold War II, uh, you know, Back sort of politics. Uh, yes. Do you, uh, are Let's you okay it. with that? Yeah, of course. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. We did uh, domestic uh, last time. So we'll maybe we'll. Yeah. The, the, the theme of this, of this podcast is that I show up ready to talk about anything that I've written extemporaneously. Excellent. In fact, Excellent. that was the theme of the festival too. We, we should, um, we, we should do a little uh, thing about Ireland at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. So, sounds good. Let, let, let's start there. Uh, so Noah, you've, you've just been in, uh, in Ireland and uh, you, you wrote a, a piece about it. Why don't you give us a little bit of your reflections? You were at a festival. That's right. There's this festival called Kilconomics, which is um, basically comedians interviewing economists and, and sort of econ commentators about things. <laughs> um, and so then it was, that was pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty hilarious. It's run by a guy named David McWilliams. Um, you know, he's sort of like the, the, you know, Paul Krugman of Ireland in, in terms of his like commentary in the media and he's an economist and, um, yeah, it was just really great. Just wonderful to be there. Uh, it was this little town called Kilkenny, uh, which is just the most picturesque, beautiful, cool little, uh, city. You know, it's like got 26,000 people. It's a pretty small, uh, city, but it's just, it's just gorgeous. And, um, anyway, I, uh, I plan to go back at some point. Uh, cause it was really great. That's great. Um, well, w while we're on the topic of Ireland, you were reflecting on why and how Ireland got rich. Um, and what, that's right. You, uh, yes. Unpack that a bit. So, um, you know, I, 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 I try to keep it entirely positive and, and, uh, not dunk too hard on anyone in the post, but here I can talk about it. Um, if you go back to look at, uh, you know, 19th century stuff and 18th century stuff, you see massive sort of anti-Irish stereotypes and anti-Irish, um, you know, racism in, uh, you know, British and, and, and even wider Protestant culture around the world. You see these diagrams with like, you know, the, the noble British skull versus like the sloped ape-like Irish skull and <laughs> some of these, you know, old, uh, old things from like 150 years ago or whatever. And you had, um, you had anti-Irish pogroms in uh, in America. This is not widely known. We we would have, uh, you know, Protestant uh, English de uh, descended people would get together and sort of rampage through Irish neighborhoods, burning churches and just you know I don't know raping, pillaging, whatever they do in those kind of pogroms. And, um, and that happened. And there was a famous the Philadelphia one was the most famous one, but it wasn't the only one. And so that was kind of crazy. And um, and then you know fast forwarding. Uh, even as recently as the 80s, the stereotypes, uh, the, the sort of negative stereotypes of Ireland is this kind of backwards place where everyone is just, uh, you know, has a bunch of kids and is dumb and, and nobody really does anything and everybody just sits around resenting Britain, you know, uh, was was there, you know, that stereotype was there. Um, and then fast forward 20 years from that and Ireland is richer than the UK uh, one of the richest countries in the world, um, just, you know, this, um, this absolute locus of high value activity, software, manufacturing, you know, electronics, manufacturing, pharma, biotech, stuff like that. It's, it's this extremely rich place where engineers from all over the world want to go work kind of this, one of this, you know, like elite small European countries, uh, and it's part of the EU. Um, 
you know, like, like Denmark with lower taxes pretty much. And, um, and that's great. And so then my question is, how did that happen? Like, well, f- well, first of all, forgetting about how it happened, uh, for the, for the minute, it really should get us to understand that our, our stereotypes of nationalities and ethnicities are bullshit. You know, fundamentally, these are snap, you know, th- those stereotypes are sometimes at, at, at best, right? Those are kind of snapshots that people use to kind of understand a little bit about some other culture while trading with it, you know, when you're sailing around on a wooden ship. And at worst, it's just pure chauvinism. You know, it's like, oh, my civilization is great. Your civilization sucked. And we see it all the time today. And it's just important to look at Ireland and look at what it accomplished and, and say, um, like, all these stereotypes of Irish people are bullshit. Actually, there's a really funny uh, data point here, which is that um, there are these people who compile these, like, IQ by na- you know, national IQ average data sets. This guy named Richard Lynn, he's been doing this for, for decades and decades. And if you look back at like the, the 90s, he's get of course, those data sets are crap because the tests aren't done the same way in the same country. And because, you know, like they're influenced by a lot of other stuff. Anyway, um, but that aside, you look at his data in the 1990s and he shows Irish people like this, you know, very like sub average IQ in the 90s. And then, you know, uh, in the by by like 2011 or something like that or 20 2009 i don't remember exactly when his his next update of his data set was suddenly the irish have above average iq and i'm like okay one of two things could happen number one maybe getting rich in actually increased irish iq by making a whole bunch of people you know take a bunch of tests and get more education blah 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 which we know increases iq and all this stuff number two this is bullshit you know <laughs> you he fudged the numbers because maybe there were a bunch of different IQ tests available and you can pick the one and you just, you've heard that Irish people are really smart and can all like manage engineers and program computers and all this stuff. And then you're just like, okay, I guess Irish people are smart now. I'm just going to update my stereotype of Irish people by, by picking a different IQ test and picking the high value instead for my little bullshit data set that I put out that every single like race and IQ bro on the internet uses religiously like look at ireland and the two data sets look at how it changes it's bs anyway so then but, it, but it's funny that our, our perceptions of like which people are the smart people and which people are the dumb people changes entirely based on on you know the, the, these things that change in the world and the these stereotypes change and, and and tomorrow you know which which group of people will people think are smart and and you can just sort of look at economic trends and think you know in, in 2017, I think it was, Amy Wax, this law professor, is saying, um, she said, what invention have the Malaysians ever produced? You know, she's never heard of Malaysia. She just thinks it's a country she can sort of punch down on without getting pegged for racism because, you know, like nobody actually knows what's in Malaysia and she doesn't know what's in Malaysia either. Uh, Malaysia has actually this great electronics industry and exports more electronics per capita than America by far and, you know, does a lot of semiconductor stuff and actually has you know, invented like a decent number of things. And so I just wrote a Bloomberg post, you know, back then saying like Amy Wax doesn't know the first thing about Malaysia. But the the thing is that, um, or, or Poland, right? Like in the old days, they used to have like dumb Polish people, stereotypes, racism and whatever, right? Now Poland is, is getting really rich. Their economic growth has just really taken off. Their, you know, Polish brands are starting to get popular, at least in the EU. Um, and then, you know, Poland is sort of this locus of high-tech manufacturing, uh, and uh, and now people are like, oh, of course, Polish people are smart. Copernicus, right? We knew they were smart all along. And so, <laughs> right, like so today, <laughs> so like, yeah, so so Poland and Malaysia, you know, tomorrow you're going to add whoever's whoever just understands the world through these stereotypes is going to add countries to the roster and you're going to add Nigeria. That is going to be a thing because a, a million like Nigerian computer programmers and nuclear engineers and whoever come over here and just do amazing things or whatever. All the people who go by stereotypes are going to add Nigeria to their list of like countries we think are smart pretty soon, right? I mean, like there was a time when when people thought China was this dumb country, right? And dumb backwards country. Um, and so, so anyway, it, it just it just stepping back, you you see how useless these stereotypes are and how backward looking and how much they're still based on this idea of like 
the, the civilizational essentialism thing of like, oh, we beat you in a war, therefore you must be dumb. We are the imperial overlords. You are the subject servants. And it's, you know, it, it's still just a way of, of preserving that sort of thinking. And it doesn't work in this world when countries like Ireland or South Korea or Poland, who never had empire you know, who were never these imperial overlords are now getting richer than the countries that did have empires. You know, Ireland's richer than Britain, Poland's richer than Russia, South Korea is richer than Japan, um, uh, you know, in terms of like per capita GDP uh, at purchasing power parity. Um, but then, you know, the, these countries, but going to these countries, you can feel it. Like you can absolutely see that like Ireland is richer than the UK right now. The UK is very shabby. Uh, you know, can't build any housing. I Ireland's not necessarily great on building housing either, but you see uh, the UK is, is very finance focused and finance took a big hit and then they did Brexit and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can absolutely feel that that Ireland is richer right now. And and so, so yeah, and, and um, the world is changing and countries can get rich without having empires and people need to realize that their old stereotypes are outdated. Yeah, well, well said. Just while we're on the topic, what is the legacy of Brexit? Obviously, it was you know incredibly contested at the time, or not even legacy. What, what would the impact of Brexit been a few years after after it happened? How should we think about that? Well, I mean, you can see British productivity is flatlined, um, and a lot of other British economic statistics look really bad. One big reason for this, I think, is that um, the British economy was and is heavily weighted towards finance. Finance is what they do. It's, you know, London is sort of the New York of, of Europe. Um, and it's very difficult to be a financial center when you cut yourself off from the, the common market, right? Like if, if your thing is selling electronics or whatever, then maybe you cut yourself off from, from the EU market and maybe there's some tariffs or something, but you can still sell your products. Like if you sell, you know, computer chips or whatever, like people still buy your computer chips all over the world, if you, you know, if you leave the EU. But or 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 high tech machinery or blah blah blah. But you know, um, if you if what you sell is is financial services and you cut yourself off, I think it's going to be a lot harder to recover from that. And so Britain had this this pro finance industrial policy uh, where they they you know the city of London was the generator of their external wealth and you know that was their that was their tentpole industry. <clears throat> I think that that has taken a real hit, and now. Finance, you know, if you want to finance stuff in the EU, it's just it's easier to look for somebody outside of London. I think that that has been a real blow to the UK in terms of immigration. It has not been as big a blow as was thought. Um, the UK is getting uh, more immigrants overall than it used to. It's getting fewer immigrants from the EU, but it's getting more immigrants from places like India. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's going to balance out in terms of immigration. Uh, of course, it is exactly the opposite of what the Brexit people would have liked because they were like, keep Britain white. Well, guess what? No, you just did the opposite of that. Um, so anyway, yeah. Can you, can you explain the, 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 for people who weren't following it at the time, sort of the smartest, uh, you sort of pro arguments for Brexit and, and counter arguments to that? Like what, what was the smartest people saying on both sides in terms of what, what the reason for it is or what the impacts would be? Well, the, the EU, so, so the EU has a lot of dysfunctionality. Right. Um, they have a lot of overregulation. And, you know, right now you can see them focusing on overregulating technology as this sort of which they think is an alternative to actually innovating. They're like, well, you know, we didn't actually do anything to help create AI, but instead we're just going to make the rules for AI. And Europe thinking that, you know, our market's big enough where we can just make rules about how you're allowed to use technology. And then those rules will spread throughout the world. And we actually control this technology, even though we had no uh involvement in the creation of it. Well, guess what? That's wrong. And it will just make you poorer. And eventually people won't care about your market so much. And you can absolutely see this massive economic divergence between Europe and the United States. And so in that sense, uh, it could have been smart for Britain to go its own way and to say, okay, we're just going to be this small open economy without all these rules. And we're going to, um, you know, we're going to embrace new tech instead of trying to overregulate new tech. And we're not, you know, also there was uh, the, the financial fiscal angle um, you saw in like 2010, 2011, you saw the Euro crisis where basically uh, the South European countries went bust and wanted Germany and the North European countries to really bail them out. Uh, and then, but they, but because they were part of the Euro, they couldn't, um, I, I guess Britain was never part of the Euro, so that's not as much big of a problem for Britain, but essentially being yoked to some of these more dysfunctional European countries like Greece might not be a good idea. Uh, of course, th that's th those are the smartest, uh, you know, arguments in favor of Brexit. 
most of the people making the arguments in favor of Brexit were not making those arguments. Britain had kind of been Eurosceptic from the beginning, valued its autonomy, blah, blah, blah. And I can't really speak to that. A lot of this was just xenophobia. It's like, oh, these, these weird foreigners coming, you know, they must be coming from Europe. We've got to like break off so we can seal the borders. Well, guess what? That, that's the opposite of what happened. Dumbass. And you don't want to do it anyway. Anyway, so, so the, those, the smartest arguments for Brexit are basically that the EU is a dysfunctional institution. That makes sense. And, and, and basically that certain countries were sort of carrying the, the weight for other countries and, and they felt that they didn't, it didn't make sense for them to do that, right? Right. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. Have you ever wondered where your donation could have the most impact? In 2007, a group of donors had that exact question. But when they sought out information from charities to help them answer this question, they instead received cute pictures or unhelpful stories. Their experience led them to create GiveWell, an organization providing rigorous, transparent research about the best giving opportunities they've found. GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found in global health and poverty alleviation. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free. You can make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities, and GiveWell doesn't take a cut. If you've never donated through GiveWell before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org, pick podcast, and enter Econ102 at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from Econ 102 to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. This episode is brought to you by Daffy. Daffy is the most modern and accessible donor advised fund, and they have a mission I think we can all get behind, helping people be more generous more often. Daffy stands for the donor advised fund for you. With Daffy, it's so much easier to put money aside for charity. You can make your tax deductible contributions all at once, or you can set aside a little each week or month. And you don't just have to donate cash. You can easily contribute stocks, ETFs, or crypto. Then you can give to more than 1.5 million charities, schools, and faith-based organizations in a matter of seconds. My favorite part about Daffy is that it lets you be more strategic with your giving and tax planning by having a single source of charitable deductions. Plus, you never have to track receipts from your donations again. Daffy does it all for you. It's free to get started, and they're giving Econ 102 listeners a free $25 to give to the charity of your choice. Go to daffy.org slash econ 102. That's daffy.org slash econ 102 for a free $25 to give to your favorite charity. Let's segue to, to a piece that you wrote um, that, you know, what we're just seeing right now is, is sort of the second Cold War and, and sort of, uh, you know, these sort of battles that are flaring up are kind of that, that in action. So why don't you uh, un unpack that a bit? Right. So, so I think it's important to understand that the second cold war is not like a thing that gets labels that like nothing has like official second cold war label on it. Right. And nothing even had an official first cold war label on it. When you saw stuff like GI Joe, do you remember the cartoon GI Joe? Are you old enough? GI Joe a long time ago. Yeah. Vaguely. Right. It, it was this cartoon. It was, uh, you know, not aimed at any other country, but it was like, or, or um, it was just like sort of glorifying military people. Um, uh, how about Top Gun, the first Top Gun? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And so they, they, they go, you know, uh, Tom Cruise eventually goes and like does a dog fight with some Russians. Um, and so it was like Russians bad, scary. And uh, or, or Rocky, Rocky Four, right, where Rocky fights the Russian boxer who killed his friend. Right. And it's like, um, it's very much this unifying Cold War message of, uh, you know, like um, the the white American and the black American unify to defeat the uh, the true enemy, who's the Russian. Um, and so no one ever like took a little label and said, this is part of the Cold War and slapped it on Rocky Four or Top Gun one, you know, and so no one ever did that. And yet we all knew that this was part of the Cold War, that there was this Cold War going on. There was never any like it with with a normal with World War Two you had a declaration of war, I guess with the Vietnam War and, and you didn't but then you know, uh, it's it's a model the Cold War is a model it's a it's a theory of a, a thing that's happening in geopolitics that we uh, that we 
um, then look, we, we look at stuff that's happening in the world and then we say that is part of Cold War II. And at some point we start saying Cold War II. You know, people didn't always say the Cold War. Like at the beginning of the, the Cold War, people didn't call it the Cold War. They, that only happened later. Um, so at the beginning of Cold War II, nobody was calling it Cold War II in part because that's a scary term. Because it's scary to think that we are, you know, us versus China. Like it's, it's you know, we want to be in that post Cold War One moment, that that happy moment when it was just the era of globalization. Everyone was trading nicely, and it was the end of history, and and you know, whatever. Everybody's going to be happy and democratic and friendly and blah blah blah. And um, and that period's over. And we, you know, we need names and concepts for what comes next. And Cold War Two is a name and a concept for what comes next. And it doesn't look exactly like Cold War One because you don't see uh, nuclear standoffs as much yet. Um, you do see a nuclear buildup in China. China's building up its nukes. It has, China has about 500 nukes now. That's up from 400. They're going for maybe 1,500, which would put them at parity with the United States and Russia. And the United States may build up its nukes as well. Russia just sits there and hopes their nukes still work. Um, but you're seeing a little bit of that. But primarily, Cold War II is, you know, it's a, there is a battle of ideologies going on. It's not communism versus, uh, versus you know, liberalism anymore. But it's, there is a battle of ideologies out there. There is, you know, there's proxy states, there's proxy wars. And I think that the Israel war has woken people up to this reality in an important way, because we've seen that there, there's no automatic reason why the United States should strongly take Israel's side and why Russia and China should strongly take, uh, you know, the Palestinian side, why they should but honestly take Hamas's side in this war. There's no reason inherently why they should do it. You know, China doesn't have a bunch of, of Palestinian immigrants who are pressuring it. It doesn't even have elections. It doesn't care. It doesn't get anything from Gaza or Palestinians in general, right? It, it, um, it's, you know, China threw its weight behind, uh, you know, Hamas, uh, in the, the, you know, many ways, including in a lot of the propaganda that's being released, a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda in, released from China right now. It did this for geopolitical reasons, because it figures that it can it can get one over on the United States. It can, um, you know, because the United States is supporting Israel, China figures if they lever, you know, just global anti-Israel sentiment, they can portray themselves as the leader of the global South, right? Or the champion of whatever. I mean, China threw a million Muslim people in concentration camps and basically turned their entire Muslim province into this kind of hellhole of surveillance and constant surveillance and, and whatever. And they're sterilizing people on mass and they're, they're, you know, people call that a genocide. I'm not sure if we should call it a genocide, but it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's mass oppression for sure. What China is doing to its Muslims, um, they got away with it. Turkey protested a little bit and the other Muslim countries are like, please give us investment, China. Um, you know, so uh, China did that, but is not, you know, China would love to portray itself as the champion of the Muslim world, despite all the horrible things it does to its own Muslims. And um, and maybe this gives them an opportunity to do so. So they're they're doing this for geopolitical reasons. And Russia, of course, is is not just, you know, propaganda, supporting Hamas with propaganda, but actively helping Hamas in its war effort. Um not because Russia necessarily cares, you know, that doesn't really give Russia any advantages in the region or in the world, but it's because um, this war and the U.S. support for Israel is a thorn in America's side and distracts America from Ukraine, right? It, and so the, the fact that all these conflicts now automatically get globalized and unified uh, by the great power conflicts immediately, that is what I call Cold War II. I, Cold War II is a model for the fat for the the phenomena for all these phenomena, you know, for the phenomenon of um, of every conflict and every issue getting turned into a great power competition between the United States versus China and Russia. Right, that is what I'm calling Cold War II. Nobody ever declared it. Mm -hmm. And you also wrote a post about how you think that Asia is more important to us than the Middle East and thus the sort of implication we're, we're spending too, we're distracted by the Middle East right now. And we're not thinking enough about Asia and, and the conflict in, in, in Ukraine about how, how that intersects with Asia and thus we should reprioritize accordingly. Or what, why don't you sort of make the, the argument about you, what you think as it relates to that? Well, okay. So um, we used to think the Middle East was this incredibly important strategic region because of oil. When there was the Arab oil embargo in, uh, you know, 1973, 
it really hurt our economy a lot. In fact, that website, what the fuck happened in 1971 is that I'm my eternal anger against this website is, is actually 1973. <laughs> uh, and it was the oil embargo. That was it. It was the oil shock. Um, that was really bad. And so we thought, okay, we need to uh, make sure that the Middle East is stable so they can keep pumping oil, oil, oil. Right. And we didn't do an insanely good job of that, to be honest. But that was the thinking for years and years. And in the 90s and 80s, people would always talk about like wars for oil. And people thought that Iraq war was a war for oil. It wasn't. It was just George Bush trying to look tough. But yes, people thought it was a war for oil. But then since then, a couple things have happened to make the Middle East a much less important strategic region. Number one, the United States itself is oil independent. We figured out and we invented a technology fracking that could get us oil from our own shale that can meet all our oil needs and more. Right. We can get all our oil. We don't need foreign oil anymore. Now, our, some of our allies still need foreign oil. You know, Europe and, and Japan, whatever, still rely on Middle Eastern oil to some degree. Um, but, uh, you know, we no longer do. And so in terms of oil demand, um, electric, electric vehicles are increasingly cutting into global oil demand. And oil prices are highly elastic, meaning that, um, you know, small disruptions in supply can... Um, um, or small, small increases in demand, let's say, can increase uh, price a lot. But by that same token, small decreases in demand can, um, can decrease price a lot. And so EVs are really going to eat into to oil uh, demand. And so that's going to put a lot of downward price pressure on things. So the Middle East is not a strategic region. Also, Israel and Gaza have no strategic connection to, uh, to oil at all because the you know, the major oil producing countries, except for Iran, you know, the Saudis and UAE and all the, you know, these, these Kuwait, all these oil producing countries in the Gulf are, um, those are now effectively on Israel's side, although they're a little, you know, Saudi is too embarrassed to go through with its deal, but they've actually been talking about resuming their deal once a ceasefire happens and blah, blah, blah. And so the, those countries are just going to keep pumping whatever, however much oil they were going to pump anyway, they don't care. And the idea that they the idea from like the 1970s that Israel is this proxy for America in the region, which can force the Arabs to pump oil is stupid and wrong and dead, right? That's, that's, that hasn't been true for many decades, if it ever was true. And so there's no, this is not a war for oil. There's nothing we get here, right? And Iran, which is sort of, uh, you know, are the most anti-American country in the region, although Iranian people love America, but, but Iran, Iranian, Iran's government does not like America at all. Um, they can't really do much to us. Like they're not, you know, they're not sending Al Qaeda style terrorists to kill us uh, here. They're, they're not really doing that. They're, um, they're not really a threat. Uh, and so the Middle East is just not that strategic a region for us. Asia, on the other hand, is the most strategic region in the world, not because they have oil, but because that's where economic activity is located. And if the United States is going to continue to be a wealthy nation, Asia is going to be an important part of that, right? We need to not just import stuff made in Asia, but also export our stuff to Asia and, uh, and lever technology that is invented and made in Asia, of which there's quite a lot. And so the United States has to have a good, has to have a positive um, economic relationship with Asia. And in addition, uh, and that doesn't mean a positive economic relationship with China, but the rest of Asia is really important, super important. And also, um, China is the one country in the world that could kick our butt, right? Russia can't kick our butt unless they like launch nukes and destroy the world or blah, 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 launch, you know, if their nukes even work. Um, you know, and their military was sort of exposed in Ukraine, right? They they uh, really, really struggled and, and um, you know, mostly got their butts kicked against a force that's much smaller and weaker and more impoverished than them. And so that was just a terrible performance. Russia is not that big of a threat. Now, Europe should focus on, on Ukraine a lot, right? Um, they're not going to focus on Asia, but we, we need to focus on Asia. Like China is the one country that could kick our butt. All, you know, our most important allies are in Asia now um, and our, our most important economic interests are in Asia. So we need to figure out how to, um, you know, how to extricate ourselves from Middle Eastern conflict you know, and people are like, oh, if you cut off aid to Israel, Israel will just be overrun and destroyed. Well, no, America's aid to is total aid to Israel is like 16 percent of Israel's defense budget. Like they could just raise taxes just a little bit and cover that easily. Um, we provide them with a little bit of technology via arms exports. But honestly, like mostly the technology goes the other way. Israel invents stuff that we use. Um, and so honestly, Israel's not that like strategically important. It's important to Americans for emotional reasons, you know, 
uh, but it's not important to America for strategic reasons as much. Hey, everybody. Eric here with a word from our sponsors. If you're a startup founder or executive running a growing business, you know that as you scale, your systems break down and the cracks start to show. If this resonates with you, there are three numbers you need to know. 36,000, 25, and 1. 36,000. That's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlined accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind, so you get a customized solution for all your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist, designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, and netsuite.com slash 102. NetSuite.com slash 102 to get your own KPI checklist. NetSuite.com slash 102. You don't buy the Iran argument of hey, hey, Iran. You know, if Iran gets nukes, then um, you know they're, they're a serious threat, and Israel is the only ally in the region. Um, so even buying, even putting aside the economic or oil arguments, which which you debunked, but just sort of the foreign, uh, you know, um, national security around, um, you know, keeping a threat to Iran. Do, do you see that as 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 important or no? Well, first of all, Israel. It's not like if we withdraw more from the region, Israel and Iran are just going to be buddies, right? No, right. No, they're not going to be Right. And if Iran tried to launch a nuke at us, we we have our own nukes and can nuke them. We don't need Israel's nukes, right? Israel has like a few nukes. We've got like a lot of nukes. We can just level Iran anytime we want, you know? Um, yeah. Iran, Iran isn't going to fuck with that. We'll turn them into a parking lot. Like the nuclear deterrents are effective and we, and we probably need to bolster our nuclear deterrent and get a few more nukes, which makes me sad. But then um, well, we've got like 5,000 nukes in storage that we actually do upkeep and actually do work unlike maybe Russia's and that we can, you know, refurbish. So we could actually go up to, you know, uh, 6,500 nukes or 7,000 nukes pretty easily. And that that's a big deterrent. Like, you know, oh, you have a 5,000 year old civilization, you know, wow. How would you like for that to end in an afternoon? Like no one wants that. Yeah. So our, our nuclear deterrent is, is sufficient. And um, and we do not need Israel's proxy nuclear deterrent. That is not a thing we need, right? And getting involved in the Israel-Gaza war does not help, does not limit Iran in any way. In fact, it probably helps Iran because it makes Iran look like the champion of the Arab world and blah, 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 blah. So um, there's no, there's whatever we're doing to try to stop Iran from getting nukes has nothing to do with Israel and Gaza at all. It yeah. is unrelated to Israel and Gaza. Totally. So your view is, hey, Israel will be fine without our support, and thus, and um, thus we don't need to support it to support Israel. I mean, um, and it's not like we have other strategic interests to support because, yes, Israel is our only ally in the region, but we no longer, you know, require the same sort of, um, you know, and oil needs that that we used well, to not. because, yeah, they're not our own, our only. Oh, ally. so who, we who have else? Saudi. We, no, and the Saudis are our ally. Yeah. I mean, I don't like yeah. Saudi Arabia is kind of a, a nasty regime, but you know what? They're our ally. Right. Not the, not uh, the Egypt same, Egypt is our ally. Right. Got it. Uh, Turkey is right. our treaty ally. Like Turkey's in NATO, yeah. man. Like yeah. I, I know yeah. sometimes we in Turkey argue about stuff, you know, but at the end of the day, like Turkey was like, oh, we can't let Sweden into NATO because Sweden, you know, supports Kurdish rebels and blah, blah, blah. And then, then the other day, see Erdogan shaking the hand of the Swedish PM. It's like, because some, you know, Anthony Blinken went to there and met with Erdogan and is like, hey, actually we're, we're allies. You got to do this. Um, and so Turkey's are, we, we have, we have major allies in the region. We have major important allies in the region that yeah. are not Israel, that are more powerful than Israel. In fact, Turkey, you know, People like Turkey doesn't have nukes. Turkey has nukes. There are officially our nukes, but they're in Turkey and Turkey has the launch codes. And if you're like, hey, Turkey, we'd like those nukes back. And Turkey didn't feel like giving them back. They'd be like, no, they're right. hard. Yeah. And so Turkey has nukes. Um, that's in the region. Like we've got plenty of allies in the region. And, you know, um, and in terms of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is much more interested in in like balancing Iran than, than even Israel is. Israel's focused on like the, the near threats to it right? While Saudi Arabia is focused on, you know, more like trying to leadership in the region, although they're not very good at it. Uh, anyway, the point is that like, yeah, even, even that idea that Israel's our only ally in the Middle East is not true. Yep. So then reflect on 
where you see as a predict uh, where you predict for the next you know, sort of decade of of the Middle East, you had a post about why you see there being less conflict because uh, the region is getting older demographically. But why don't you sort of unpack you know uh, or your predictions there? Right. Well, this is an optimistic argument, right? Um, so I noticed the other day, America. What America did do in the Israel conflict, like regardless of giving aid to Israel and blah blah all that stuff, um, what America did do in the conflict is when we uh, helped prevent it from spreading. So you've got the Houthis, who are this uh, Iranian proxy militia in in Yemen. They're a Shiite uh, militia. Um, who they're very competent, actually. They're quite good at war, and uh, Iran Iran tends to pick its proxies very well. They launched a couple missiles that we shot down. Uh, they just launched missiles toward Israel, just in an attempt to inflame the region more because they love fighting. Um, they fight all day. Right? The Klingons of the of the Middle East, the Houthis are. I imagine them as like you know, kaplach. You know, we love fighting. And so anyway, they uh, we we shot down the missiles that they sent. And Hezbollah was like, ah, oh, we're going to get involved there. Another Iranian proxy militia is also you know highly competent. And then um, America was like, <laughs> no, no, don't, don't do that. And we sent some aircraft carriers to like hover right over them. And they're like, okay, well, actually, you know, we support the Palestinians with rhetoric. And so then they didn't get involved in Iran, you know, bellowed, like, you're going to turn the Middle East into a conflagration. This is going to, we're going to get in this war. And they didn't do shit. And, you know, maybe they would never have done shit. But so I noticed this, maybe you can just say America's deterrence is strong. But these people did not give a shit about American deterrence in the 80s when we had many, many times more nukes than we do now and a lot more forces in the area, uh, they bombed our barracks in, uh, in, in Beirut, right? The killing hundreds of American servicemen in the eighties, um, with a, uh, you know, Iran would like constantly like attack American stuff and they were much more aggressive back then. And so what has changed? And I have a weird answer to this, which is fertility. Iran in, in, in the 1980s, Iranians had um, almost five children per women. That was a high fertility rate. They had enough, you know, and they, they went to war against Iraq and they would have these famous human wave attacks where the Basij militia would just charge forward and get mowed down by Saddam Hussein's guns. Um, and then, but they were charged. We have all the people, blah, blah, blah. Now their fertility rate is like, you know, 1.6 or something. It's like, it's, it's pretty low. Uh, below replacement, certainly, maybe lower. How, how do you explain um, it? Modernity yeah, got them too, or how, how do you explain it? Uh, well, that I mean, modernity got them, yeah, but they, they also had an intentional um, program right. of reducing fertility because they're a resource-based country and they didn't want, you know, angry young people don't just give you, you know, fodder for your armies. They also overthrow your government. And in 1979, angry young people are exactly who marched in the street and overthrew the government in the name of initially in the name of like basically leftism. And then only later did the, did the uh, you know, um, Islamist people from the countryside sort of get in on that action and muscle out the leftists and, you know, declare the Islamic Republic. And that's how the Iranian revolution went. Um, but it was angry young people and young people still do not like the government of Iran. The, the theocratic government just sucks. And so, you know, young people wave American flags in Iran if they can get away with it. And um, they're protesting all the time. There's a massive wave of protest last year. There was a massive wave of protest in, in 2011 or not, 2019. There's a massive wave of protest in 2009. They, they just have these massive wave of protests because young people really pissed off the government. But there's not many young people anymore because the government, you know, tried to encourage birth control, discourage large families. So there would be fewer young people to overthrow the regime. And a side effect of this is that you have fewer, uh, you know, you have fewer young people to start wars with and you would just have a, a, a you know, an older group of people, you know, Ahmadinejad, remember that guy? He was very aggressive, very tough. Yeah, yeah. That guy, he was born, he was one of the really big generation, the baby boom generation in Iran. And he, uh, during the Iran-Iraq war was, was governing a province at the age of, I believe, 19. Wow. At 19, yeah, this 19 year old, he's a college freshman. He's governing a province in the middle of a war. Now, Iran is sort of out of 19-year-olds, so it's instead it's like 45-year-old guys governing the provinces. And 45-year-old guys are a lot more sedate than 19-year-old guys, if you've ever met either of those. And so, um, so basically, Iran uh, is old. It's getting old. Its median age is equivalent to the United States. It's as old as the United States now and, and going up faster. 
aging faster. And if you look around the region, you see a, a similar, although less extreme story in many of the countries around the region. Lebanon, where Hezbollah is based, has, uh, you know, fairly has low fertility now. And and its median age is climbing very steadily. And the, the, the Shia community that Hezbollah draws its people from actually has lower fertility than the Sunni community in Lebanon. They're being out out uh, babied by the uh, by the by the Sunnis. And so Hezbollah, you know, is, is looking very nervously at the Sunni population of Lebanon and thinking like these guys are growing in population where we're not really the Shia community is not. So they don't necessarily have all the, the, the young people to spare in a, launching a giant war against Israel, they've got to look at their own backyard. And, um, and if you look at, uh, so, so it's, it's the same around the region. Um, there's a couple countries that are slower. Iraq has been slower uh, to see its fertility drop. Egypt has been slower to see its fertility drop. Um, Yemen. Uh, and then if you look outside the immediate Middle East, you see Afghanistan, Pakistan have also been a bit slower to see their fertility drop. But they're all dropping. Right. So like Afghanistan, when we invaded Afghanistan after the 9-11, um, Afghanistan had a fertility, uh, total fertility rate of around seven. Now, by some estimates, it's under four. So uh, and, and part of that, by the way, is due to our occupation. We, we increased women's education a lot and increasing women's education does lower fertility. That's not why we did it, but it's, it is a side effect of it. You know, we did it because we we you know, we like women getting to school. But all, but uh, the side effects is that fear kids. I mean, let's just talk about fertility for a second. Um, is Israel the only modern or, you know, sort of country that's experienced, gone through modernity that has a above, you know, re well above replacement uh, rate? Or, or what, what are what is sort of the record of countries that have been able to uh, be well above two in terms of replacement rate? Um, while, yeah, like, and what, 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 what can we learn from what's happening there? I should mention, by the way, that Israel is pretty screwed in this regard, too, because all of Israel's army comes from people who have low fertility rates. So Israel's high fertility rate is entirely driven by a bunch of super religious nuts, um, these yeah. ultra ultra orthodox Jewish guys who have um, just, you know, eight kids per family. They've got nuts fertility rates, but they also have a very though they're anti-Zionist, right? They don't believe in Zionism. They are not they, they won't their kids don't join the army. Right. And they don't really get jobs either. They're they're. You know, the religious are anti-Zionist. Fertility rate is, yeah. What are they? they what what do they want? Israel. I don't know. A relationship with God, man. <laughs> um, they, Interesting. Got it. The 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 settlers, the 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 Zionist settlers, will sort of act as a paramilitary force. And by the way, they're very brutal and they steal people's land and they're just ethnic, you know, racist dickheads. Like these settlers, they're. Um, you know, they will ethnically cleanse and, and massacre West Bank Palestinians and take some of their land for their little settlements. Those people have high fertility rates. But then, but the ultra Orthodox within Israel do not, they don't believe in Israel. They don't think they moved to Israel, but they fundamentally don't recognize the, the sovereignty of like nations and the importance of nation states, right? They're like, they're like, it's just them and their local community and God. Yeah. Right. It's like they don't even care. Um, we've got like a few of these people in uh, in America, um, you know, and and walking through the, their their little towns, you feel like um, you're in the Middle Ages. They're really they're not on board with the state of Israel and they don't serve in the army. So Israel's got a problem in this regard, too, because of that. But don't they also have a problem? in the sense that they'd be outnumbered like if, if there is a either uh you know one state that includes is israelis and um lots of palestinians or lots of arabs that uh palestinians and arabs just sort of um have more kids and that they would you know over a generation become uh, a minority within their own state isn't that a concern that many israelis also have well well a couple a couple things about that number one it is a definitely a concern they they have number two recent fertility trends mean that that concern is is less of a concern um, because the, um, the, the Palestinian fertility rates are, are, you know, haven't gone down as much as like Iran, but it's, they've, it's been going way down, uh, Palestinian fertility rates, just like almost everybody else. Um, the, the religious, the Israeli religious nuts can't, would outbreed the Palestinians like over long, over like the decades and decades. But, you know, more importantly, to the extent that Palestinian fertility rates are still high, it's because Palestinians are poor. If Israel wanted Palestinian fertility rates, uh, especially in Gaza, not to be that high, you know what they would do? O allow the Palestinians to have a freaking economy and not be poor as hell. You know, the Israelis are dumb. I can't, I cannot emphasize enough that the Israelis are dumb. All right. Dumb. 
And if you see like the little comedy thing they put out making fun of Columbia University, they're like, oh my God, these people are dumb. Like, um, they're not good you know, at PR. You want some national stereotypes. That. I started out by saying Ireland is smart. How about your national stereotype that Israeli is smart? No, Israelis are dumb. And so like Israel is like, oh, if we just stop them from having an economy, there'll be less of a threat. Yeah, but if you have stopped them from having an economy, they're going to have 10 million kids. <laughs> you are dumb. <laughs> and, and so like, Anyway, um, I mean, you know, obviously stopping people, having, making people have less kids so you can like outvote them is not a good reason to grow an economy. Yeah. You know, but I'm saying that the, the, the fact that Palestinians still do have slightly more kids than Israelis, um, is a, is a downstream effect of the, of the brutality is blowback from the brutality and, you know, that, that Israelis have leveled toward the Palestinians and not letting them have an economy of their own. Um, so it's like, think of the consequences, see what will think of what will happen here, but no, you don't cause you're dumb and you just react by just smash, smash, you know, anyway. Well, where is Israel in 10 years, right? So they, they might lose us support. Um, or, or, you know, U.S. support might wane because, you know, there was this tweet that went around that said basically U.S. Palestine sentiment, they were comparing it to sort of uh, gay marriage sentiment in the 2000s, where it was basically, you know, polarized by age and old people were against gay marriage, young people were for it. And then, you know, old people die out and, and you know, soon enough, Barack Obama and all these people are, you know, say, you know converting from anti-gay marriage to, to pro-gay marriage. And similarly, you know, more young people are sympathetic to pro-Palestine cause. So it seems like within a generation or two that the U.S. will be, will, will the, you know, sort of perspective on Israel will change significantly. Um, you know, you, you talked about the demographic concerns that Israel has. What does that mean for Israel 10, 10 20 years down the road in, in their place in the region? Well, Israel has been remarkably stupid about this and they may be fucked because, um, and if Israel wants to look at an example of what being fucked looks like, Israel should look north to Armenia. Um, Armenia had Russia as a patron, and then one day that patron wasn't there. Armenia was militarily aggressive. It tried to, uh, you know, it, it, it used military force to take over the, the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, right, 1994. It flooded it with, you know, Armenian settlers who basically ethnic cleansed the local Azerbaijanis. And then when the military balance shifted and Russia became, you know, stepped away as a patron because it was focusing on other things, like getting its ass kicked by Ukraine. Uh, so when Russia, when, when it lost its patron and then the Azerbaijanis modernized their military and actually got a decent military, Armenia was fucked. And now the, the, you know, the settlers of Nagorno-Karabakh are getting ethnically cleansed. The descendants of those settlers are getting ethnically cleansed. And so there's another round of ethnic cleansing. Now to be, you know, to be clear, that is a very bad thing. And Azerbaijan is engaged in, in ethnic cleansing that they shouldn't be doing. Um, but, you know, and so I condemn that obviously. But the point is that Armenia was remarkably stupid in its lack of foresight and its choice of. So what, what happened was that under Netanyahu, uh, Israel began, became more, um, became more, uh, authoritarian, quite a bit more authoritarian. He was a Trump like figure, but unlike Trump, he was competent in terms of maintaining power over time. Uh, he was, um, and he was much younger as well. And so he, uh, so Netanyahu hollowed out a lot of Israeli institutions, which is one reason Israel was taken by surprise by the Hamas attack on, on October 7th, because Netanyahu had taken away all the border soldiers, right, to, um, to go to the West Bank and to try to do land grabs there. And so, um, or to support the settlers who are doing land grabs. And so, so Netanyahu um, uh, has been remarkably bad for Israel's competence, right? He's this this populist leader who's not, who's good at sort of one thing, which is seizing power within Israel and bad at actually making Israel strong. So Israel has got, and, and under Netanyahu, Netanyahu tried to cozy up to Russia and China. He's like, okay, well, I'm being more authoritarian and Americans are getting pissed at us about that. So instead of actually not being authoritarian and, you know, and being a liberal, instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cozy up to Russia and China. Well, now Russia and China have totally just like betrayed and, and screwed him over right? He's all his years of cozying up to the authoritarian powers are coming home to roost uh, because it turns out that guess what? They're not actually on your side. You failed, you idiot. And the idiot, you know, the, remember Israel has been remarkably stupid and Israelis have voted for Netanyahu again and again, because you know, the, the country is collectively dumb. Um, 
And so, so Israel's really screwed. Um, you know, Israel's making peace with, it, it will eventually make peace with the Saudis. Um, it, 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 Israel is not threatened at all by like the Arab countries, like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Gulf countries. Those are no threat. Those do not threaten Israel, Iraq. You know, that threat to Israel is in the past. That is many decades in the past. Done. Um, Hamas threatens Israel. Hezbollah threatens Israel. At some point, the government of Syria could conceivably threaten Israel again, although maybe not anytime soon. Um, those are Iranian proxies. Iran's proxies threaten Israel. And, and so Iran when you say screwed, that, that's what you mean? You, you mean that these these yes. pressures will be just endless? Um, these conflicts will be endless? Yes. And they'll, yeah. Yes. There's no, yeah. and, and so, you know, Israel does have nuclear weapons. Um, yeah. it could, it could nuke its enemies. Um, I think that Israel is not as screwed as Armenia because ultimately, you know, some, some crazy right-wing Israeli guy the other day said, oh, we could just drop a nuke on Gaza. Well, if Israel is existentially threatened, it will use nukes. Um, uh, Israel could nuke Hezbollah. Israel could just like flatten Lebanon with like, you know, 10, 20 nukes, um, or at least the, the Shiite parts of Lebanon. Um, Israel could nuke the capital of Iran probably. They could, uh, they could not, they could, they couldn't, they don't have enough nukes to turn around at a parking lot, but they could certainly, yeah. you know, kill the leaders of Iran and disrupt and degrade the Iranian state to the point where it probably collapse, um, so, with some nuclear weapons. What would need to be true for you to be bullish on Israel? Like what would need to change to be bullish on Israel's prospect? Oh, they need to kick out Netanyahu, which they all want to do, by the way, his, his approval ratings falling fast. So they need to kick out not just him as a person, but his entire movement. They yeah. need to bring back, you know, liberal technocrats. Um, they need to um, court Europe as more of a patron than, you know, than, than America. Um, they need to, uh, they need to um, pull settlements from the West Bank, move all those, move all those people to Israel. Um, of course, those people are then going to vote and they're going to be really right wing. So that's going to be a problem. Um, but at least, or at least pull them to like some settlements that are really right along the border, maybe. Right. And then, uh, and withdraw from the West Bank, allow the West Bank to have a real economy, stop oppressing. And, and, you know, in terms of Hamas, like if you can actually root out Hamas, if that's actually a thing that can be done after that, stop the blockade of Gaza, allow Gaza yeah. to have a real economy, allow Gaza to flourish allow Gaza independence. It's an independent country de facto. Allow it to be an in actual independent country. Don't be like China with Taiwan, where you're just like, this will never be independent, blah, 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 blah. Right. Let them be independent. Who should run Gaza? The Palestinians, you know, a um, Palestinian authority. Sort of the same Palestinian um, authority that runs the West in, Bank? Maybe, yeah. Like, so, so realistically, we don't actually know who that would be. Um, but I mean, okay, the, realistically, this is what will, this is what would happen. You would kill enough people. So you would kill enough of Hamas people that Hamas would have a schism between Hamas people who want to make a ceasefire and Hamas people who are like fight forever. Then the people who are like fight forever, a lot of those are the rich Hamas guys living in like fancy hotels in Qatar, have the Mossad go assassinate those guys, go like kill Khaled, Mashal, whoever, right? Um, kill, kill the Hamas guys sitting, uh, you know, in the hotels, just like room service. <laughs> And so just, you know, kill those guys. And then, um, you know, Israel used to be good at that. Maybe they can still do that. Uh, but then um, <laughs> don't, don't put that, don't put room service bang in the cold open. We might have to. <laughs> maybe or maybe do. Oh, God. Uh, room service. You're dead. Land shark. <laughs> Candy gram. Um, if you've ever seen exactly. that. Uh, okay. I'm joking about assassinating people in foreign countries, extrajudicial killings, but I mean, like, yeah, do it. You know, it's not like Hamas yeah. cares about like judicial procedure and killing as many Israelis as they can. It's like, yeah, it's war, just kill them. Yeah. Um, then, but, but, but there will be a moderate faction of Hamas that will split off and be like, okay, we want a ceasefire. Those yeah. guys will be the government of Gaza. And yep. the, the brutal truth is that when there's a, like a, a nasty evil regime, it's the moderate people of those nasty evil regime that end up being the best people to govern the place afterwards. Yeah. So all the people who governed West Germany and made it really liberal, they were all Nazis. Yep.
right? Almost all. And all the people, they were not from like some anti-Nazi opposition that was like sitting in a concentration camp. Then we let them out and we de No, we didn't. We, we said, okay, you were, you were a Nazi, but you didn't like, you know, you were just sort of like a bureaucratic Nazi in a back room, like <laughs> who was like, well, I'm not on board with the kill the Jews thing, but I support my country and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're a Nazi. Right. You could be you could be killed without the world suffering like a great moral loss. But instead, uh, pragmatically, you're the only people who know how to run Germany after the war. And we need someone to run Germany and make it a liberal country. And so Japan the same way. Right. We hanged some guys like Tojo and we hanged some like leaders of Japan. But all of the all of the liberals who made Japan one of the most liberal countries in the world were ex fascists. Yeah. And and. This idea of ideological cleansing that we deployed when we invaded Iraq, meaning there was no one competent to run Iraq after we de it, right? We cleansed, ideologically cleansed the entire administration politics of Iraq. What That was really, really dumb of America and of the Bush administration. Yeah. We should have just killed the high-level guys, let the low-level guys keep running the, you know, become the high-level guys and keep running the thing and just say, okay, now run it in a liberal manner. Right. Yeah. And so they did, they, they would have done that. And Iraq would have been a much better off place. And, yeah. you know, and, and in Japan and Germany, that is what was done. So moderate Hamas people, you know, maybe you laugh and you're like, oh God, I can't even stand to hear that phrase. Moderate Hamas people, blah, yeah. blah, blah. You sanction the killings and rapings. Of, well, they did. And you, but if you're going to have a liberal, reasonable administration afterwards, that's exactly who you're going to have to get to run the country. Of course, Israel is dumb, as I have reiterated many times. So they're not going to do this. Yeah. And and when you say dumb, your critique is, is is basically saying, let me just summarize to make sure I understand it, is that by hamstringing Gaza's economy or not accelerating or, or letting it flourish, um, you're actually creating more of an enemy against you. And if they were richer, they'd have less desire to commit violence um, because uh, sort of like, you know, just like any other group of people, when they get fat and happy, they don't want to commit sort of, you know, crazy acts of violence. Is that is is that the exact reason why why they're dumb, basically? That is that is one one manifestation of Israel's poor choices. Cozying up to China and Russia without realizing those guys would just betray them in a heartbeat was another yeah. example of poor choices. Yeah. Degrading institutional capacity of Israel's military, intelligence services, and you know bureaucracy. That was another manifestation yeah. of poor collective choices on the behalf on, on the part of Israel. So the dumbness is not just what you described, but what you described is an important component yeah. of the dumbness that has manifested in Israel under Netanyahu. Totally. And just to explain the counter, because that, that, that's what we what we do is um, on, on this podcast. It, 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 I think the counter would be something like, hey, um, that's very possible. What you said, uh, hey, G uh, Gaza grows their GDP. They become less interested in, in violence. And then we have this great collaboration, whether it's two states or, or whatever it is, and, and everyone's happy and that, that's the dream. The, the counter is, hey, maybe it, their sort of uh, desire to um, you know, commit violence against Israel is not only because they're poor, but because there's something deep rooted in their education system or whatever, you know, this sort of like their culture um, sort of on a generational level not, not inherently, but just it just so happens that it's played out this way, that if they were to get a lot richer, they would just use that on violence um, in the same way that the people who run Hamas are very wealthy. Uh, and, you know, or they the people say they use the donations to commit violence. And thus, you like, it's like, you can give their two state solution. But then what happens when they when another 10 seven happened, like what, you know, like, or if that happens, and, and there's a concern that it could it could happen. Um, do you are you sympathetic to the counter? I mean, I, I think it's the it, it, the counter is correct and doesn't invalidate what I was saying. Got yes, it. you're you know um, you're still going to have you know massive large scale hatred toward Israel in uh, on the part of the people in Gaza. And like, if people bomb the shit out of my country, I'd hate them too. Yeah, <laughs> like I can't, it's not like I blame them. Um, right. or, or like you know, of course, you're going to have hatred towards the the Gazans in Israel because of. Well, like the question is, are, are you going to have more violence or less violence? Gaza with, with 2x GDP or let's just say or whatever less x violence. GDP. Less violence. Okay. You're going to have less violence. Right. People, will, people will hate but not necessarily kill. Right. Um, especially if the governments of Gaza and is, uh, you know, especially if the government of Gaza is supported by the United States. Mm -hmm. If and And there's your pro-Palestinian sentiment right there. We can channel pro-Palestinian sentiment into American support for you know, 
uh, liberal governments, more liberal governments, stable governments in Gaza and the West Bank, um, you know, the West Bank will require removing Israeli settlements. You can, we can have, you know, with American support, those, those Palestinian regimes will be, they'll still hate Israel, but they will be unlikely to do murder suicide attacks against Israel. Right. And, and, and there still may be, they still may launch rockets. There still may yeah. be border skirmishes. I'm not saying there would be no violence at all between these people, right? Still be some terrorist attacks. This region is not going to be peaceful soon. Okay. And if yeah. you think there's some magic button you can press that makes this region peaceful, well, the only magic button you could press that makes the region peaceful is nuke everybody and let God sort them out. But we're not going to do that. Thank God. So, yep. um, but the point is that uh, there's no button you can press to make this region peaceful. There are things you can do over time to make it more peaceful that we've learned the lessons of history, right? You can just look at what worked and what didn't work. And what didn't, if you think that you can brutalize a people into submission as a way of deterring violence again and again forever, you are wrong. That will come back to haunt you and kill you in the end. You cannot brutalize a people forever without them ultimately figuring out a way to kill you. Is well, is, is U.S. and World War II a, 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 like a counterexample of that or, or not really in terms of like Germany or, or et cetera? Like there U.S. and World map. War II is the example of what I'm talking about. Got it. Yeah, I'm talking about we learn. We got to learn the lessons of World War II. So uh, flesh, flesh out. Basically, you're, you're saying that um, how, how is that an example of what you're talking about? So in, in World War II, we did not um, uh, we did not occupy Japan and Germany forever. After the war, there, there was this there was this saying that the best way to grow your economy is to go to war against the United States and lose. Because after the war, we poured resources into Japan and Germany and gave them full access to our markets and backed up their governments. The governments that were run by people who had been part of the Nazi, German, and fascist Japanese regimes. They were made up of former Nazis and former fascists. That is who made up those, the bulk of those governments. And yet we supported them. We poured resources into the country. We protected their borders. We helped them, you know, even though we had just been slaughtering them a few months before, right? We had been just slaughtered, like strategic bombing, doing stuff to Japan that was, that was more horrible and more cruel than what, um, than what uh, Israel has done to Gaza. We did worse stuff to Japan. Watch Grave of the Fireflies. We roasted people's moms. You know, we, we, you know, even before the nuclear bomb, which wasn't even, that wasn't even the worst of our destruction. The worst was the, the firebombing campaigns that preceded it. Actually, the nuclear bomb was less destructive um, than the stuff we'd done before. And afterwards, you can watch uh, The Fog of War. You can watch the movie Fog of War, where Robert McNamara, who, you know, helped order those bombings, one of the guys who ordered those bombings, like cries on camera and says, we were war criminals. We did that. And yet, and, you know, and I don't feel good about that. And after, I don't feel good about just doing that. But after the war, what I do feel good about is that we supported regimes in Japan and Germany that were liberal regimes that were made up of people who had been part of some of the most evil regimes of history. You know, they weren't the top guys, they weren't the top decision makers, but they had been part of it. They'd been part of those evil regimes. We used those people, we, we, we allowed those people to be in power, we supported their governments, you know, we poured money into their economy, we developed their economy, Japan and Germany became some of the richest countries in the world, the most technologically advanced countries in the world. We helped provide security for them against, you know, threats like uh, like the Soviets, right? Who had been our ally. We then protected West Germany against the Soviets who had been our ally against Soviet threat. And we protected Japan against Mao or, you know, whoever would threaten them. And we did this. This was smart. We need to learn that lesson of history. Um, that's, 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 that's well argued. Um, let me zoom out because and, and geared towards closing, cause we're, we're over, over an hour here. Um, what you're, what you're, the broader point you're making is, hey, Asia is more important to, to, the, to us than the Middle East. And what that means to our strategic interests, that means that we should you know, gradually pull out from the Middle East or, or you know, sort of direct less attention there and more attention to Asia. Any other tactical things you think we should be doing on the, on the Asia side that we're, that we're not yet doing or haven't yet discussed in this podcast? Yes. So I think we need to, uh, you know, under Biden, we've done a better job than under Trump or Obama of shoring up alliances in Asia, a much, much better job. Biden has just been much better. Um, Trump raged against China. Biden has actually been building alliances against China, which is much more effective. 
but we need to we need to supplement that with an economic piece. So we withdrew from the TPP. You can argue about the TPP all day, but we need some sort of Asia wide economic agreement um, that doesn't include China so that the United States becomes the indispensable economy to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to India, to Bangladesh, to all these countries. We need to become the indispensable economy to these countries. So these countries aren't just like, well, what are, you know, our only option is for external help, right? Is to like march to China's tune. You know, we need to give them a different, a different tune. So they don't have to march to China's tune. And so they, um, you know, we need to, yeah, support in, um, and in Vietnam, we need to support the industrialization of these countries. We need to open our markets to these countries. We need to invest in these countries. We need to, um, you know, have uh, build infrastructure in these countries. And this won't just make money for these countries. This will make money for us too. Um, but we need to do this uh, in Asia. We need agreements, multilateral frameworks in Asia that 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 replace what the TPP would have been, and. Um, and that also help bind those countries, not just to us, but to our rich allies, Japan and South Korea. We need Japan and South Korea to become extremely important to India, to Indonesia, to Vietnam, you know, and the Philippines. That's the piece that we're so far missing. Yep. Um, maybe that's a good place to, uh, to, to, to wrap. This has been a great conversation on, uh, on all things, uh, of, of, you know, Middle East and, and Asia. And maybe next week we'll go back to a domestic episode. We'll, we'll, we'll alternate. But uh, but given your uh, you know uh, international right, right at the moment, uh, thought it'd be thought it'd be good to 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 go to go outside. Um, Noah, uh, always a pleasure, and until next time. Absolutely, until next time.